89 WLS Rope Con Show with Richard Roper. Uh, Rope couldn't make it today and uh, he wanted to send his respect and regards here to our very special guest, uh, Staff Sergeant Ryan M. Pitts, who joins us right now, the recipient of the Medal of Honor. It's a, it's a great honor to have you here. Thanks for having me. Lauren, I was going to ask you actually if you could just uh, tell the folks a little bit. I know a lot of people know Ryan's story, but if you could just read a little bit about that and then we're going to. We'll talk to Ryan about his experiences. And this is amazing, you know, when you were in Afghanistan, Ryan and his fellow soldiers were attacked by 200 assailants who were determined to take their posts. Those 200 insurgents were firing from bridges and from the village and from the trees. Soon the enemy was so close that Ryan could hear their voices. He whispered into the radio, he was the only one left, and was running out of ammo. I was going to die, he remembers, and made my peace with it. Then he prepared to make a last stand, bleeding barely conscious, Ryan threw his last grenades. So there you were in the middle of, you know, this firestorm, and um, I, I can't even imagine what that was like for you. It was, uh, you know, chaos in the moment, but, you know, we fought as a team. I looked around at guys like Jonathan Ayers, who stayed on a machine gun until he was killed, mm -hmm. Jason Bogar, who, you know, treated casualties and continued to fight. And I just try to do my part and follow the lead of, you know, all these other great soldiers around me. Ryan, is, does it speak, I guess it does speak to the, to the great training you get in the U.S. military, that you're able to rely on your instincts and your training even as you're seeing your brothers falling. And you don't have a moment at that moment to, to grieve for them. If you know they're gone, you have to keep doing whatever you got to do to continue to fight back, to defend yourself, and to give information. To your colleagues how, how do you compartmentalize that in the heat of the moment like that uh, I mean you're right in the heat of the moment I'm not thinking about what's going on or there's not deep thought it's all reactive instincts. Uh, it is instincts mm -hmm. and you know that time to mourn comes later I acknowledge and I, I feel that loss with every loss that we had but it was the way we were trained you know I felt very fortunate that we had great leadership like Colonel uh, Bill Oslin and Captain Matt Meyer that it was just instinct for us to do our jobs one of the things that you're quoted as saying uh, in a CNN report is that you wanted the nation not to remember your name, but those of the nine men who were killed. Yes, uh, their names were Sergio Abad, uh, Jonathan Ayers, Jason Bogar, Jonathan Brostrom, Israel Garcia, Jason Hovader, Matthew Phillips, Pruitt Rainey, and Gunners Willen. Interesting that you say that you see them as the real heroes, but you don't know, maybe see yourself as a hero in all this? No, I don't, because for me, it's always been those that make the ultimate sacrifice are the real heroes. And, you know, the word, the term above and beyond the call of duty, the only action that I see above and beyond the call of duty is to lay down your life for your brothers. And that's what those guys did. And so they're my heroes. Yeah, absolutely. And I thought it was, you know, the, the, the ceremony with the president uh, and the reading of those names and, the, and very, you know, the right thing to do. And just a moment, I think the entire country was really moved by that. It's amazing stuff. So, you know, going back to that moment, Ryan, you, know, you are relying on your training, and yet you you do have to, you know, rely also on your own improv improvisation, if you will, in terms of like, you know, we're hearing the stories about not only uh, pulling the pin on the grenade, but holding it for as long as possible so that you knew, because you knew the enemy was so close that when you threw it, it was going to, you know, create the, the maximum damage, and that's a decision you have to make right then, right? Yeah, absolutely. But again, that goes back to training. That was mm -hmm. something I had practiced, or we had trained on in basic training. You know, in those moments, the thought process isn't a, so, a thought process so much as I'm going through everything that mm -hmm. I've learned, we all are, of what can I do with the resources I have, what similar situations have I been in like this, and you just act based on all that information. And in the same way when you're, when then you were on the radio and then giving, you know, as much information as you can, you're surveying the situation, and you know that merely by speaking, you, you're giving away your location. You were close enough to hear the voices of the enemy at that point, right? Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, that's why I tried to whisper so that they wouldn't know that I was alone. Uh, so that way, if they did come inside the post, at least I'd hopefully have the element of surprise on. And what about, you know, again, I mean, this is this is you know just amazing when we hear these details. But I mean, you had sustained some very serious injuries. Is, is, it, is, is it again, are you just putting the pain aside? Are you aware of that? Or is it just a second by second thing where you're just doing whatever you can in the moment? Initially, it was it was shock. I didn't mm -hmm. feel any pain at the moment, but knowing the gravity of my issues uh, of my injuries, I had to get treated. But then I'm watching all these other guys fight and the volume of fire that's coming in and how serious it is. Uh, you know, I I couldn't sit it out. You know, if I could make at least some impact in the battle, like all these other guys were doing, then I had to do the same. 
when you make a decision to go into the military and you go through the training and then suddenly you're put into a war zone, do you, do you even envision that it's going to be like this? I mean, and you're suddenly you're in the middle of it. Does it even resonate with you before you're in the middle of a firestorm like this of what it's going to be like? Or is it just completely different than anything you went through in training? It, it's something, you know, we trained a lot. We trained as, as much as we can to as realistic standards as possible. You know, we train how we fight and we fight how we train. But there's no, there's no substitute for actual experience. You can't explain or replicate that without living through it. Staff Sergeant Ryan Pitts, the recipient of the Medal of Honor. We're going to take a quick break and pick it up in just a couple of minutes. My buddy started joining, and it just seemed like a, a great thing to do. I wanted to serve my country, and I, well, I never have, regretted it. Yeah, you have, my friend, absolutely. We're going to talk to you a little bit. I know you know that today that the president signed this $16 billion bill to help veterans, uh, and you know, it, it, to me it's something that's long overdue, and you just can't do enough. And as you well know, I mean, the, the, the stories about veterans coming home and not even be able to see a doctor for three or four months, to me it's just, you know, it's it, it's... It's just not right. I mean, and this looks like a good step in the right direction. I know, obviously, you've had multiple surgeries. Lauren just asked you off the air how many surgeries you had. You weren't even sure. But I just wanted to get your reaction to that today. Well, I mean, I've been to the VA system in New Hampshire, and it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. My care was prompt and of high quality. Uh, but, you know, th that amount of money going into the system, I think our, you know, our veterans and service members have earned the right to physical and mental health when they come home. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great thing that the system's going to get that money to, to hopefully make some, you know, more improvements. Well, what was it like for you when you recently visited some of these VA hospitals and you talked to, you know, fellow soldiers? Uh, I went here in, in Chicago to the Jesse Brown and then to the VA Medical Center up in, in Milwaukee. And, it, you know, very high quality facilities here from what I could see just in my short time there. And, and talking with some of the service, the veterans there, that, uh, you know, they seemed happy with, with their care. And, you know, there are a lot of great people doing doing great things there. But I'm sure also helpful and for you with everything you've been through and losing, you know, people uh, that were close to you in your unit um, and then going through and meeting other veterans who have sto similar stories to tell. And it's, it's very difficult often to be the survivor, I would imagine. It is, and it's taken time to process that. I mean, I think... Oftentimes we think, you know, why did we make it and the others didn't? Mm -hmm. But I try to look at it as they made a sacrifice so the rest of us could come home and they would want us to be happy. They'd want me to be happy. And so I owe it to them to live a life worthy of their sacrifice. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, you, you strike me as a guy. I mean, you're, you're doing this and you're doing a wonderful job. You've been in, in a number of different cities. But you strike me as a guy that never was looking for the spotlight. I got that sense even during when you were the recipient of the Medal of Honor that although you were very humbled and proud, and, and you know, but I just got the sense that this is not your thing, that you never would have envisioned yourself in, you know, in, in, behind a microphone right here in front of a television camera or anything like that. No, that's not me. But you know, for me, just like a lot of the guys I served with, it was all about the team. Mm -hmm. We did things together. I wasn't the only one that fought that day. There were guys like uh, Lieutenant John Brostrom and Jason Hovader who ran in front of enemy positions to come reinforce our OP. And it, they knew it probably would have cost their lives getting there, but it was all about the team. We were dedicated to each other. So, you know, I don't like being sick about it as an individual, but I've tried to use this to, to highlight what we did together. It's, it's ours, not mine. One of the things I find, you know, very encouraging, I'm, you're way too young to know this, but I remember when I was a kid, of course, you know, the Vietnam War was so controversial. And at first, during the war, and in the, the immediate aftermath, you know, veterans of the war would come home and not always be treated with the greatest respect. And people had, I think they had trouble distinguishing between a war that was controversial and soldiers who were just doing their job and serving their country. And as you know, as years went by, there's a lot more respect for anybody who, who served in Vietnam. But I think in this day and age, I think one of the great things is that most people, regardless of their political views, regardless of whether they think we should be in Afghanistan or we should get involved in Iraq or anything like that, have great respect for the military. Do you find that when you're traveling from city to city? Absolutely, and I think uh, a great deal of that we owe to those Vietnam veterans, mm. that they laid a lot of the groundwork for us to have better equipment and to be better treated when we got home. Um, you know, they didn't have that, and I've always, uh, you know, it's been emotionally difficult for me mm. that they, they didn't have that type of welcome home. I can't even imagine how difficult that might have been for them. Absolutely.
coming home, um, you see your wife, you have a one-year-old son, you want to tell us about him? Yeah, mm -hmm. he's uh, 15 months old, Lucas, and he's the, the center of, of our world. And, uh, you know, I look at him and I see the guys that sacrificed everything, mm -hmm. and then he's here because of them, and I want him to grow up knowing who they were and what they did. And now you are in the private sector, and, you know, uh, my co-host Rokan talks about this all the time, too. You know, anybody in any kind of business, to me it seems like a no-brainer. If you want to hire somebody who knows all about discipline and hard work and dedication, who better to hire than a veteran? Yeah, I think veterans bring a lot of a lot of skills to the table. We don't always see it when we're in service, how does our job relate, but right. you know, we know how to be a part of a team, we know how to lead and shift back and forth between those roles. Communication, I, you know, I've seen this as trainable, that's what we do. I mean, there's, there's so much more that we can give back to the country uh, beyond just what we did in our service. Yeah, because in addition, we were talking about, you know, the VA hospitals and everything, but to me, when you hear about, you know, the high unemployment rate sometimes for veterans, it's just, it, that to me is heartbreaking too, yes. because you think about, men and women who were willing to do everything for their country and to come back and look it's not it's not an act of charity or an act of kindness it's just it's just to me again it makes sense you know that this would be somebody that you'd want to hire absolutely i mean when i was getting out of the military i was medically discharged from walter reed uh, there were a lot of programs in place to help prepare us to get out uh, classes on resumes uh, applying to college job skills things like that and even going back to college there are a lot of opportunities afforded to me like internships so, I mean, I think there's a lot out there to try and help us bridge that gap to get us hired on after we come back home. So what is next for you? I don't know. I'm going to go home next, spend some time with my wife Amy and son Lucas. Uh, family's first for me. Um, you know, I, there's, a, there's a responsibility I feel with the award to service members and veterans. Absolutely. I don't know what that's going to look like yet. Uh, it may take me several years to figure out that sure. balance between family, career, and that responsibility, but I'll figure it out. I think you're doing a good job of figuring out right now. And I just want to personally thank you. You know, the reason we get to sit here behind a microphone in this country and give our opinions, and, and everybody does, is because of you and your colleagues, and we can't thank you enough for your service to our country. Thank you. It was my honor to serve. Yeah, Sergeant Ryan Pitts, thanks so much for joining us.